The condition is really crazy condition. And that shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Matei Yakino giving up to our power off his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team has just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast. Yes, back again for episode number two. And this week, we have got an ex-world champion, an all-round nice guy, and one of the hottest properties in the slalom windsurfing world. It is, of course, the Italian stallion, Matteo Iacchino. Hey, Matteo, how's it going? Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Um, yeah. where I guess you're in Tarifa. Um, how's the whole COVID situation for you? I know you haven't been uh, back home for for a while. Italy has been uh, kind of the epicenter of the thing in Europe. So um, tell us, tell us uh, what you've been up to. Yeah, basically I decided to stay in Tenerife because I thought we were there for training with you as well, and uh, we thought that would have been a, a good choice to stay. As, as you said, Italy was kind of fucked up at the moment. And when it started, it was the worst uh, country. So I thought, okay, Canaries is going to be isolated somehow. It's going to be get better like sooner than the rest of Europe. So I stayed there. And then uh, actually we went to lockdown as everywhere else. And I was stuck there. I mean, I cannot complain because in the end we had a nice house uh, facing the sea, we went on the balcony. I was going to the surf every day, doing some workouts, doing some stuff in the in my cent- the new center as well. But um, yeah, I've been locked down as everybody else. So, and then uh, and then basically, yeah, Italy went worse and worse. Uh, nobody that actually I know got um, touched. Uh, concretely by the coronavirus, but uh, I indirectly I know that many people uh, got got really bad uh, uh, bad moments from it, and um, and yeah, I couldn't go back home. So then, actually, with the uh, with Blanca, I was staying with Blanca in Tenerife. So she wanted to come back home, and then there was a flight to Seville. Uh, we had the opportunity to go to Tarifa. Uh, like a couple of weeks ago so we took the flight and we left Tenerife so I thought at least I had all the gear uh, and uh, and myself like on the continent somewhere where I, I could reach with the car in case the situation would, uh, would stay, stay longer or something and then uh, here I actually was a bit easier because the beach is super long I could get on the water uh, uh, sooner and, uh, and everything, but uh, yeah, I leave the situation as everybody else. So yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, I escaped. I escaped on the last hour, kind of before all the flights got cancelled and everything. So, and it wasn't so obvious. We were there. We thought we can kind of sail every day and get stuck there. So it was not that yeah. bad. But um, what are you, you know, with the season being kind of postponed more and more? How and what are you training? What are you focusing on? Because I've been seeing a lot of foiling on your Instagram. So <laughs> tell us about. A little well, bit. no, that the point is that I there was a moment I just like I got really pissed. I got like a bad uh, bad vibes. I don't know. I was pissed that uh, because we trained and everything, we focused and uh, and we were losing event actually. I mean, it's getting postponed, but uh, we're gonna we, we are losing most of the events so then i got pissed and then i, I realized actually our situation is not the worst uh, because uh, there's people uh, living worse situations uh, and the business side uh, of uh, of it is actually even worse so basically we i started training as as nothing happened so i started going trying to go to the gym actually i found a, a guy training here on the gym on the beach and now we started going to the to the gym again. Uh, I, I'm training as if the, situ- the, the 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 season is starting like uh, in a month or so. And actually, I'm, I'm used to it, so that that's what I like and keeps my good vibes on. Uh, so I feel better if I actually train. I'm I'm focusing on more on foil just because it's the new trend, our new discipline, and everything. And I thought it was a, a good idea to to get time on it. 
more time on it, like a uh, bit more training on it uh, than on Zalo normal. Obviously, if it's super windy or something, I go on fin, but uh, otherwise, I spend time on, on foil. Uh, I mean, here in Tarif, I have plenty of people foiling anyway, so it's a good place to be for uh, for that. And uh, so, some secret, so some secret plans to to go for the Olympics, to go for the IQ foil. Obviously, that's way um, well, ahead of us, but yeah. Looks not, like. not so secret the plans. I mean, I will, I will try. I think we all, hopefully, hopefully we all PWA guys will try. That's what I hope. Uh, the format looks promising. A bit promising is a big word, but it looks better than it was for us. Uh, I guess maybe working a bit harder, we can uh, we can make it happen so that uh, our world is one world is not anymore divided in uh, ten pieces. Uh, and I really believe in it, even though maybe the nine meter can be a bit too small for our for our weight and stuff like that. But we should have slalom until 15 knots and then a course racing above it. So I think in that in in that case scenario, if uh, if the judges are applying the rules as it should be, uh, we have a real chance to to be professional on PWA and everything, and also do an Olympic campaign. And I think that would be the first time in history, apart from Robin Ash when he was uh, on Mistral, I guess. Uh, he could do something like that, but after that, there was no connection between the two wars, no? Yeah, but I think, as you know, our 15 knots and, uh, and the RSX Olympic class 15 knots is not exactly the same. And even if the rules say that we're going to be slaloming until 15 knots, you know that one gust above 15 knots and they're going to jump straight to course racing, right? I, I think that's kind of the vibe in that Olympic world. At least this is what I'm, what I'm feeling. So I don't know. I'm just, just uh, asking if you're prepared to, to go full power on it, you know? <laughs> No, well, my my main goal is still be a professional sailor on the PWA. I, I love I love what we do, and then uh, I I got here just because I because of my passion and I love what I do and and actually every time I go out yesterday I found myself pumping on the ten meter, uh, reaching. Eh? I was still on foiling. I was not uh, <laughs> up and down. But then I re- it, it reminded me last year in Costa Brava when we had uh, a few. Actually, everybody thinks about Costa last year of nuking wins, but actually we had like a, a couple of days of really light course racing, and uh, and this uh, reminded me how I hated it and uh, and how nice it is to what we do actually, how fun it is, how cool it is. So no, there's no nothing in my mind that is gonna cancel my. <laughs> passion for the PWA and what we do. If I can do both, uh, I will do both. If I have to choose, I will stay on PWA. No, yeah. no wonder. Speaking, I guess about, <laughs> speaking about uh, love and passion and stuff, I mean, uh, you're recently doing quite a, a lot of media. Is it something that you're really enjoying? And I can tell you why I ask because I mean, right now we're going to do an hour long interview or something, but um, yeah. just just recently uh, we had the news of uh, Bernd Rodriguez giving a, <laughs> an interview um, <laughs> where he calls Nash corporate America and basically says they're full of shit. And, you know, as an artist, he doesn't want to be a part of this world that is so, you know, um, kind of focused on money and promoting yourself, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so what's your, what's your take on that? <laughs> I don't know. I read it. And, uh, as most of the people, like, um, I kind of enjoyed actually this, uh, highlight. <laughs> there was something interesting to read. I was quite surprised that a professional sailor would, would write something like that. I mean, it's, not, not talking about the prototypes or anything like that. I'm just talking about, on a professional point of view, like a, a professional sportsman shouldn't behave like that. Uh, even, if about, that's, even if that's what he feels, you don't feel like you should just kind of speak your mind. I mean, 
No. I don't think so. I think you should give you. I mean, these guys, however the support, however the support was, I don't know if he was getting paid, he was getting free gear and whatever. The point is that you you are kind of uh, throwing shit uh, to the people that were actually believing in you and supporting your your passions and and making your dreams come true. Let's say. And then just because they they kicked you out, maybe in a bad way, I have no idea. Still, you shouldn't publicly uh, do something like that. That's my, that's my personal point of view. Obviously, you can tell me. I don't know. Uh, it's better to be. I actually read the, the Toma Traversa, for example. He replied that he thinks that he did a good thing, and we all know this stuff and whatever. No, everybody has his own point of view. My point of view is that you shouldn't do it. You can have your personal uh, things that you, you can discuss. For example, he can discuss with Robbie personally. He can call him or meet him probably because they live, both live there. And, uh, and they, can, they can have a beer together and, and discuss about it. But there's no point to, uh, especially in a moment like this one and everything, like uh, our sport is small. This is a bad moment. There's no point to throw shit on a, on a brand like that. There's no... I mean, there's there's no positive yeah, outcome of it. No, there's no not yeah. one positive thing that comes out of it. No. Yeah, it's not like his value all of a sudden is gonna grow. But this is what he probably means that he was sick of, uh, you know, this kind of uh, promoting uh, something that he doesn't believe in. You know, but he could say he could say like Nash dropped me, and I'm happy because I didn't really believe in what they represent. That yeah, would sound a lot more professional than saying than saying uh, like yeah. I'm an artist and Nash is corporate America and fuck you guys or whatever. And yeah, anyway, this is I was never that. using Nash boards, yeah. so it's 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 maybe yeah. it's kind of a soft way to say that. But uh, the the point is that he would never say that something like that if they were not dropping him. So that's the true. guy is is uh, is is kind of talking bullshit because in the end he's just like behaving as a uh, Captain America uh, in a situation where he wouldn't open his mouth if he was not getting kicked out of his uh, uh, of, of the team of Nash team no? probably yeah, it looks quite bitter yeah, probably I just wonder and then they took Ricardo and probably obviously we all know that there is this much of money actually now it's like this and if you get some some big name then somebody else has to get kicked out. And, yeah. uh, and then he got kicked out. But if he was not, probably he would never publish this. So if, if he really believes in what he says, he should have said it anyway, even before uh, he was getting kicked out. No, That's my... Yeah. my if he is really this, uh, this moralist and everything, no? Otherwise... Well, that's actually a say. really good point. Yeah. <laughs> As he, as he says that he knew for years and it's for years that he's feeling uh, uncomfortable since this other guy that uh, with all the respect uh, uh, was close with Robbie I have no idea of the story of Nash, the Nash brand so uh, he names this guy that looks like he was a good friend of Robbie or whatever so since this guy left he says that uh, the company went down and whatever so why was he there? No, I think uh, Harold Iggy is uh, is the original shaper of Nash, and he actually died a few years ago. So I think that's yeah, what. But what I mean is that if he really thinks that uh, after he left, uh, he died, poor guy, um, uh, the brand went down, and he he didn't like uh, the, the vibes he was getting, whatever. Why was he there? No, if he's such a free sailor, free-minded uh, guy, whatever. No? Yeah, and I think, I think um, I don't know about you, but me many times, not many times, but there has been times in my career where I just didn't like the situation and I left regardless of, um, of whether I had another sponsorship or, or not. You know what I mean? Like if you, if you don't feel that this brand is fully... Um, together with your values and it doesn't help you in our case it's also a matter of gear how good the gear is etc so you know then i i had this deadline that before this deadline i couldn't sign another deal because it was too early but i just left because 
I thought like, okay, I'm going to take the risk because I have the belief in myself that I can get another sponsorship, you know? So if he, yeah. like you say, you know, if he, um, if he left, if he had the confidence and he didn't believe in what Nash is doing, you can probably leave before, you know, without. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I mean. I mean, if you really feel because if he was uh, harsh in this, no, he was like, uh, he was coming from inside, looks, looks like. So if he had this, such a bad feeling that he was sitting, I don't know, uh, with different balls for years because, uh, and he was not, he didn't like the fact that they were shooting with, different, with, pro, with normal boards and then he was writing on prototypes, whatever, he should have left. It never happened to me. Uh, happened to me that uh, uh, because of the team that was kind of too big, uh, I was uh, in a position that I had to decide uh, uh, either to stay there and like not really having free room to move or go somewhere else where I could actually grow and, and go my direction. So this is what happened to me. And then I decided to go uh, on, my, on my way. But, uh, I, I always had uh, like a, the support uh, as a professional athlete in that case. So I, I, I never faced the scenario where I had to choose between maybe not having a sponsor and leaving for nothing. Uh, uh, so I cannot really talk about it. I don't know if I would do it. I, I think, I think uh, it's not really a secret that the situation you're referring to, we're actually going to get to this, is a situation where both you and Pierre were on North Fanatic and you were number two and three in the world. And uh, there was either room for uh, both of you guys taking a pay cut or one of you guys staying uh, kind of... of yeah, yeah. With, with what you deserve, right? So, so that's, that's a tricky tricky scenario but in the end it, i guess it worked out for the no, best it went, both. it went perfect it went perfect i mean uh, i i actually is always a i don't know if you can say in english in italian we say jump in the dark like uh, as if you jump uh, in somewhere you 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 don't you you trust but you don't see uh, because you never compete on the on the new gear. So if you if you come from a situation where you are kind of winning or going really good, and you go somewhere else, even though you are really believing where you are going, you are not really super hundred percent sure. But then it went it went good for me, went good for Pierre. I mean, the whole situation went fine, and uh, and uh, and as I say, uh, what if I I actually changed many sponsorships in my life and uh, uh, in my career. And I, I never thought about going public. I, I never had any situation where I should actually, maybe once, where I should actually go hard on a, on a, on an older on an older sponsor, let's say. But I always thought it's bad. Uh, I mean, you can talk with a guy because the, always the issue is like with one guy. It's not like with the whole company or something. It's with one guy, no. So you can always talk with a guy, and that's it. You would never go writing articles or. Um, you know, yeah, I, th I think I, the, yeah, because, because everything has a context. So then if the context is that the brand dropped you, you, you look really bitter. You know, you look really, it puts yeah. you in a, it's a bad position to start saying these things. Maybe if you say that, I don't know, once you're retired, you know, 10 years from now and whatever, you have an interview like this and you say something like that maybe it sounds a little bit different but anyway let's not get too hung up on that on that situation i mean you mentioned uh, you mentioned the uh, kind of that you changed a lot of sponsors and that you know you kind of come, come came a long way you know from uh, kind of northwest italy i think when i met you you were on uh, actually on point 7 or something but then yeah it was point 7 starboard when you met me on garda you mean yeah when we were kids, I was point seven. I mean, I was nothing. I was uh, my parents. <laughs> yeah, I was getting discounts, discounts, and my parents were buying a, a couple of boards from Starboard Italy, from the distributor uh, that back then was uh, Link uh, Distribution, and uh, but it's still Giampiero is the same guy, and uh, and point seven. I started with the with Andrea 
went to my dad knew Andrea, so I went to Sardinia. I sailed with him a couple of times, uh, and I fell with his dadom, and and he helped me a bit, uh, discounts and stuff. But was by my parents sponsoring me back then. Yeah, because we we have to say, I mean, I don't almost rem- like remember you. You weren't really that good, were you? I mean, how how do you become like? Were you serious? Were you not serious about it? And that's why you were not very good or, or the opposite or because you actually went to university and well, yeah, the point is you... that I, I studied late, like compared to you guys, uh, like you, Pierre, uh, I don't know, like uh, um, Ines, uh, all these guys, Ethan now that Ethan, I, I, I remember, I mean, Ethan is super young and I remember him for ages because he's been competing since he was 14 I don't know he was already on tour so you guys have been competing a lot before no like I, I it got in my mind to start doing slalom when I was 17 16 so then uh, when when we met in Garda was the second year let's say I was doing some slalom naturally and then I do the, did the IFCA awards I was actually not slow on the 86 but I was doing I was doing shitty starts shitty jives falling stuff like that and um, and I started because I like I liked the competition, not because I wanted. I mean, obviously, my dream as a kid was to be professional, doing doing it as a job. But uh, I was doing a lot of stuff, so I was not focusing on windsurfing. No, I was like doing whatever board sports I could do. And uh, and uh, and then like that, like that, I went. I don't know if nowadays I think that maybe it was it was good. But at the moment it was not good, no, because I kind of lost the focus, no. I just like when I did everything, and then uh, so I guess that was the problem. And then before it came in my mind the, the the possibility that I could be professional, took a while. So before I started, and then I started university, as you said, uh, because uh, yeah, I was getting sponsored afterwards by Gastra and um, JP Italy, that is Luis Marqueger. Fantastic and, uh, combo. At that time, yeah, that was the first. The, actually, the first year was really good, but then it got uh, it got uh, difficult to say. And uh, but the guy was super su- supportive, Luis, and there was the the first sponsor I had, and uh, and then it got a bit more professional. But still, I was not getting the money. No, I was like uh, barely uh, with the, my sailing club, the Lega Navale, from the town where I live. They were covering some expenses, so I was doing the Italian regattas. So then I was far from being professional. No? In, my, in my mind, professional means that you, at least you repay the cost of the whole season. Uh, yeah. In our world, there's many different kinds of professionalism. No? There's people that call themselves professional when, I don't know, they pay everything. To me, professional is actually when you gain a little bit of money after you repay the, the whole year of competitions. Yeah, these days when, when you see, when you see professional. When you see professional windsurfer on Instagram, it doesn't necessarily mean that person is professional, but no, <laughs> whatever. Let's, let's not talk, talk shit. Um, but then how, how do you decide like, okay, I'm going to go on tour. I'm going to try this, this thing, you know, where you no, actually... I went on tour. I went on tour because Albi told me that uh, the, the um, Alberto told me that the best way to grow up was actually to face the best guys and get the, your ass kicked. And then you would grow up also at, on a national level. So when I got a bit of a, a bit of sponsorship from Louis, so I was not uh, asking my my parents to get to get the gear, or whatever, and I was getting a bit more money from my region and from the club. I could actually afford to to get to some uh, PWA events, the European ones. Actually, luckily for us, uh, most of the, Europe, the the PWA events are based in Europe. So I was going to Costa Brava, Fuerte. My first event was in Austria, so then I was um, I started to grow up not not because I wanted to win the PWA. I was not even close to my mind. And then uh, and then I got better on a national level, and I started winning the some national competitions, and just slowly grew up. Like uh, uh, when I see these young guys now that they they come and they want to win straight, uh, I. I, I'm not ashamed for them, but I feel weird because I remember myself in those days and I felt super far from uh, the guys winning. I, I wouldn't even talk with, to Antoine. Uh, I had so much respect and everything. And now these guys, they, uh, 
they react as if they have to come and win straight away, you know, just because maybe they are fast on one setup or something. Yeah, and we were uh, fucking clueless. Let's let's admit it. I mean, uh, I joined the tour like a year after you, I guess, and we were yeah. fucking clueless. I was fucking clueless. I had no idea. And and like you say, these days, I mean, I don't really think about it much. But once you say that, you know, some French guy comes and just because he's friends with Pierre, he acts like you know, he acts as if, uh, or he yeah. comes training in Tenerife with us, you know, and he sees kind of how we talk and whatever. And then, you know, it's like we've, I mean, you, you is a different story because you were successful already at, I don't know, 23, 24 or whatever. But fuck, it took me 10 years to, to get to where I am now, you know, and, yeah. and you come and you act as if, you know, as if it's given to you. So, so it's a little bit funny, but at the same time, I think I was, the same way because I came from a lot of junior and youth success and I thought it's gonna just repeat itself by by itself that it's just gonna happen by itself because the junior stuff it happened by itself you know so there's always two sides of that but once you actually yeah, maybe, mention maybe it, yeah. these, uh, these helped me you know because in the end I, I just ate, ate shit so much at the beginning that actually this taught me like uh, that I was nowhere so that that's why I worked maybe harder and earlier than other guys like you or uh, young guys that were winning when they were juniors and they thought that maybe they were already there, let's say, you know, while I was nowhere and I knew it. So I had to work. And then, uh, and then, yeah, like, uh, and, and, and I think what cannot be understated is also like uh, how uh, if you have somebody better than you to train, and to show you what to do. Because when I started, I was fully alone. I mean, Wojtek was already kind of gone. He stopped. Uh, there was nobody else from Poland. And, you know, the, the guys that are there on tour, they're not so willing to help you unless you are, I don't know, the nicest kid ever and whatever. And I wasn't. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think it, it, you guys had actually a bunch of Italians. There was... Rosati, Kuki, Alberto Menegatti, there was some other guys, older guys. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think this cannot be also understated. So, so yeah, but getting on tour no, early no, as early I mean, as possible, this is what I didn't really, understand. And, yeah. and I think this, this really is, is incredible. Also for the industry to, to see, you, see you try at the highest level, you know? Yeah, I think I think in the end you you have to try um, in in your life. I mean, if you are competing, you want to try your best, no? And you want to to see where you are when you actually fight against the best guys in the world in your sport. If you do it for the passion and for if you really love what you're doing, no? If you don't, if you take it as a job and a pure job, then maybe you can stop whatever. But if you if you want to show yourself and uh, think about it in the future, no, then you, you, you just want to fight against the best ones. Even if you then, if you lose and you get lost at the end. But that's, again, that's my personal point of view. Eh? Many other people would uh, answer in a different way. But yeah, uh, everybody's different for sure. I mean, yeah. then you, you mentioned the gear and kind of your first like really really good results your first podium and finishing top 10 came on f2 and challenger uh, yeah take us a little bit through that process because many times we see young guys signing for kind of smaller less known brands just because there is a little bit more uh, support and maybe from the outside it looked like that for you but actually the gear was really good. I mean, F2 at that time wasn't already a big brand or anything. It was super small and and and, uh, and Challenger wasn't really known as it is today for having great sales. So so how, how did you actually choose that and did you realize straight away that the gear was actually really, really good? That's, that's a, a big uh, argument about... Uh, like, I mean, uh, I would say that to show the windsurfing world that that you are good 
you have to do one or two years where you don't have the support of the good guys, but you, you perform as, as good as they do. When we, we were facing these, these times, it was actually harder for us because we couldn't get the best things. We couldn't get the things that they were getting. We couldn't. So we had to perform at the same level with lower, like let's say slower gear, no? So uh, this, this has been really rough, I think, uh, for us because we are, these, these guys coming now and behaving as we talked about before, they have no idea of what it means that you get to an event with a, a G10 big fin and the, other, the, the, the good guys top 10 that they are, they are anyway better than you, even with the same fin, they have a fin that, that goes like two knots faster. And even if you give your best, they will roll you. So they, they have no idea. And then you, you try to ride these guys or find out or whatever, and there's no way to get the fin. There's no way. They will listen to you. They will answer your emails. You will get the contacts. So they have no idea. And sometimes they will tell you like, like total BS, you know? Like I wrote Tectonics one time and he, he wrote me like, ah, this is what Antoine is using and whatever. And then I get to Fuerte. And Antoine is not even using tectonics, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, on, you know? So this, but um, apart from that, I actually was surprised because um, uh, I was in, uh, in year for the Swiss Cup, uh, the year before we went together. And, and Dan, Danny Eberly was there, he was working for, for F2 and he, he made me try a board and I actually liked it. And then he's like, oh, maybe the next year we can talk about it, uh, we can talk about something. Then, uh, and then on Garda, we were on Garda and um, I took the board and I tested with Albi and I was fast on the board. Then I, I, then I kept the board, I went to Sardinia and I tried the, the Challenger 9.5, I think. And with the combination, I was really fast. And then uh, I tried a seven, I liked it, uh, and they made me a good offer, let's say, for, for who I was at the moment. So they, I was happy about it. Uh, and, then, and then the gear was actually good. So the big board was really good. The small board was a bit too small, but was nice when it was windy. And the medium board, if it was flat, was really fast. It was a bit hard to pass as well, but the, in flat or choppy, was fast. So the gear was really good. I cannot complain. The next yeah, but you didn't the, take it in blind just because they offered you a little bit of money or whatever. No. You actually tried it before. I tried, I tried. I tried uh, probably because uh, I learned it again from, uh, from other guys because Alberto told me never take uh, anything before you try because if you go bad with the gear you have and it's actually an okay gear, if you take something worse, you're going to go nowhere. No? So try it at least before. And then when I saw that it was either the same or better, then I went for it, no? It's like, fuck, at least I have uh, boards I can sell, sales I can sell, I can get some money out of it. There is some more future, no, into it. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the year after, I won the European IFCA in, uh, in, uh, in Roses, that you were there too. And then, uh, and then in 2013, I won, uh, I, I went third in uh, Costa Brava with the same gear. So, and the gear was good, it was not me. I mean, obviously I was selling good, but the, the gear was really good. Cannot complain about it. Uh, yeah. yeah. It so might look, uh, look weird from the outside, as you say, as a combination, but uh, actually I had prototype masks that they were, they were amazing, uh, they were sick. I was sponsored by PowerX, and uh, they made uh, the same mask we had in production, but the production changed afterwards, got a lot better in Challenger. But at the moment, they had an older um, producer, whatever. So I got this PowerX. I got sponsored by PowerX. I got also some money from them and, uh, and a good support on the masts. And then we developed some masts and they, were, uh, they had better reflex. And the, the 9.3 was just flying on, that, uh, on those masts. Yeah. And the 8 as well. And they were the two key sizes for that season when I went then uh, at the end of the season. So... Yeah, every single jibe, you would just jibe around everybody. Everybody would stop in Costa Brava and you would just jibe around no matter yeah. how, how last you would come to the mark. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, no they, they were, the whole gear was working good. And actually, the, the big board was 82 wide yeah. and was going great in light winds. I can't complain. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was good. Yeah. 
yeah many times the many times the the big board that is actually narrower somehow works better in light stuff than in the stronger stuff i mean uh, yeah, i still get nightmares in, no? yeah i still get nightmares about malta chasing me down last year and uh <laughs> it was like two knots faster there was no wind i was like this in straight line just in the jibes yeah. there was some some gas and malte with the 81 uh, wide was uh yeah almost uh, yeah but in, the light, in the light has always been fast and last year on that uh middle big big board with six it was flying yeah yeah i yeah, recently almost. saw the video because i was downloading for another video i will do and uh, and I saw your fight. I mean, your fight. You you were ahead and trying to hold him back because he was coming in the light, and uh, that was cool. Yeah, it was actually the. I had to make that final to to make the podium, and uh, he was a lot faster. So very good that he didn't <laughs> have a better start because I would never make it. <laughs> so anyway, so then you mentioned Danny Eberly. Um, so then you make that podium. You come tenth. And then the opportunity, Danny goes to Fanatic and he kind of drags yeah. you with a lot of times these personal relationships that, you know, you see how a person works and then you want to keep working with that person. So then he changed brands and uh, you go with him and then, and then, yeah, 2000, I guess that was 14. And yeah. Then, uh, 14. 15 happens. And um, when was the actual moment where you thought like, fuck, I can actually win the world title here? Only, only before, uh, only after uh, Silt uh, in 2015. That you were because, leading, uh, you were leading heading into... Yeah, into I was Caledonia. leading heading into... Uh, after, uh, before that, I wouldn't even think about it. I mean, uh, I never won in that year, in 2015. I won my first winner final because before that year I never won a winner final. I won my first winner final in Korea. Then I won my first event in Costa Brava. So the, after my first winner final win, I was crying. I was like so happy because I was like a, such a, like, people from outside that don't understand, but we work so hard for something like that. Such an achievement that is like, it's already, even if then I fucked up the elimination afterwards uh, in Korea. I was still super happy because I won my first winner final. Then I went to Costa Brava and I won the event. And again, was like such a highlight for me. I would never think, I was not even thinking about the whole ranking or something. No, I just won there. And then I went second in Fuerte and, uh, and I loved the high wind event there. So again, it was uh, amazing. And then I, when I won Silt, I actually understood I, I, I could do it. Now, before that, I didn't th even think about it. But then the pressure be built up so much that I fucked up. Uh, yeah, I guess the minute, the minute you yeah. start thinking about that stuff, your brain kind of switches to, to a different mode and, uh, and the pressure, I guess the pressure started getting to you. Uh, tell us, run us through that event a little bit. No, the point is that I think I am a, I am a slow guy. I mean, I, I'm used the my whole life and my career in windsurfing, actually, is the only career I had in my life. Uh, came slow, no? Uh, as we talked about before, no? I, I, I lost a little bit less, then I started winning something, then I, I slowly got there, no? So when that year all this stuff happened, and then when I was leading, I, I, I had too much. I had too much. Uh, I was happy, I mean, in, in a good way, but that stressed me so much that I wanted to, to train, I wanted to. So then I spent like, the, the, there is this big break between Silt and uh, New Caledonia all the time we have it. And in this month and a half or something, uh, I was training like crazy. I was like just uh, mountain biking, uh, going to the gym, going to the water, uh, over training too much because I was just, I was not having relaxed. I was just thinking, fuck, now I have to perform. Now I have to, to be the best. Now I have, I have the chance. Maybe I will never get it in my life anymore. So, and then this actually destroyed me instead of helping me. So, and then I, and then I got there and I, and we had, I remember we had this, um, this pre-event uh, venue at uh, actually the event site where this year was held the PWA at Answata, 
with the journalist and we had this uh, this meeting with Antoine with all the press, no, as if we were the two guys fighting for the title, and this built in me such a high pressure in a negative on a negative side that I was not feeling. On top of that, we were mostly competing on seven seven, and I don't know why it was the only size I was not really fight fast that year, and I knew that, so I was stressed. I was super tired from the training ahead. I was not mentally ready, and on top of that, I knew that I was not fast. So this, and anyway, I could perform because in the end, I ended up top 10, even though I fucked up half of the event with over overlays and stuff, but uh, at least I could fight, but um, I didn't because <laughs> I yeah. fucked up the whole thing. Yeah, I guess but, this shows, I guess this shows the, the mental aspect a little bit, how a guy that has been on fire the whole year, you know, can look quite normal. And and I think and I think this shows like how how small the difference is between a guy that is you know intense and a guy that is maybe top three. I'm not gonna say fighting for the title because that's another again another mindset or whatever. But I think this kind of showed. I mean how yeah how small these these differences are. Something that maybe people don't see because they see you three guys on the podium every event um, or, you know, maybe Antoine winning, let's say, you know, I don't know how many, like seven titles in the last 10 years or whatever, six titles. And um, yeah, I think this is a really good story to show the people. But um, so this was pretty much purely psychology, wasn't it? No, no, it's only, it's only your mindset fighting. Actually, it's yourself fighting against you because you're not ready. Yeah. And then probably your body is trying to tell you that you're not ready to handle the, that pressure. I, I always say that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, something difficult to fight to win uh, a, a single elimination at the beginning when the pressure builds up because you're passing the hits and you finally get to the final. Uh, and already there, the, the beginning, you have such a high stress that it's hard to perform at your best. So that's hard. Then it's super hard to win an event because when you are leading and, and you just, I don't know, there are two days ahead and you know what is going to happen, you have to switch off your mind and just think about something else. But it's something that now we are talking like here, easy, and we know that the first yeah. competition is far away and we are laughing and nice. But when you are leaving it, it's super stressful. So again, you need to, to gain this confidence, to gain this experience, to, to handle it. And then is another step, if you, are winning the, if you are leading the World Tour and you are like heading to the last event, leading it, knowing that you have to be first and the guy has to be third and then the other guy has to be second and then you win and then you lose, whatever. And all this stuff in your mind is there, is there no? Like you, you try to hide it but it comes out, it pops out all the time. You're tired, it comes out. You are watching a movie, it comes out. You relax, you're, I mean, this thing always comes out, no? And every time it comes, it stresses you. And then, and then this is experience as well, no? This is what Antoine has more than me or Pierre. And um, we have more than other guys that didn't fight uh, until today. And the guys in the future will have more than whatever, no, that, that, that's something that you need to, to test yourself on and then, and then you kind of handle it better and better year by year, but it's, it's uh, something really hard to explain and hard to, to achieve as well, this uh, constant... Yeah, it, it's uh, funny how big, how big it feels before you do it and how normal it feels after you do it. Yeah. It's, it's insane. Like it feels so impossible before you do it to, like you say, to win an elimination or it just feels like such a big task, you know, it's really overwhelming and then you do it and, and it's just mm -hmm. the next day or like, okay, what's next? You know, it's like, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. You want more, you are on fire, no, but, uh, but you need to, to get your ass kicked a lot of times before that happens, no? And yeah. uh, on the other hand, when, when an athlete in every sport is the same, in tennis is the same, I mean, when you are on a, on a positive uh, trend, then 
and the condition is the same for us, for example, then it's really easy to replicate, <clears throat> to duplicate what you did, no? Because it builds up this, uh, this thing in your mind that you are uh, unbeatable in that moment, in that condition, and, and that makes you unbeatable. Yeah. But just because you, you start believing in yourself so hard, in your gear so much, that in the end it's like it's something incredible that comes, comes out from nowhere, and then, and then it becomes a machine, no? But is is this this day in this event there is this peak no that is amazing and uh, every i think every sportman probably has in his career a moment like that antoine had many i guess <laughs> no but, but i think uh, many guys have that you know uh, this year i mean last year i mean 2019 um i don't know how many guys won a final probably like 10 8 to 10 guys and that's that little peak but what's in between those peaks is really what makes the final result. Because, yeah. I mean, we train together. There can be a day where out of 15 races, I beat you 12 times or whatever, you know. But the next, the other days, you know, this consistency is, is really what separates. And I, think, and I think that's mental, you know. I, don't, I think in Antoine's mind, after one bad hit, there is no nothing like he's not gonna go run to the beach and change his gear or whatever it sounds so simple but like you say when you live through it it's it's incredible so yeah, it's, the, it's the best dream and the worst nightmare no can be it's yeah. kind of uh, there is these two aspects that something that scares you as as much as you can even i mean there, there is moments where you are living so hard I remember in Denmark, I had these moments where I was fucking scared and at the same time so much alive. And, uh, and then it, it, when you remember it, as you say, it looks super easy and it looks super nice. You have the best memories out of this <laughs> stuff. Huh? But when you're living it, it's fucking hard. It's really hard. It's super hard. Yeah. And um, it's super nice to live this. Obviously, I think we are really um, lucky to live this kind of stuff. Not many people doing something different they can actually leave this uh, uh you can leave it in everything probably every any kind of career but you need to be fully into it no probably yeah you mentioned we were basically talking psychology right now and i only found like one mention of this that after 2015 you actually decided to get some help psychologically I, whether it's whether we call it a mental trainer, coach, psychologist, whatever. Um, like, is it how, how is that decision process? You're like, okay, I failed. It's you almost need to admit your that you are kind of weak to 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 get not weak, but that that you could be stronger, right? And that you want yeah. to work on that. No, but I, I I had to admit I was weak because after after what happened in. Uh, that year, I mean, that I think that year was a mix because, as you said in the last uh, in the last video, we lost we lost Alberto, and Alberto was like, uh, okay, friend, whatever, for sure, but was like somewhere I wanted to 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 get to, you know. So that that was gone, and then uh, I, and then actually I won the first uh, final, I won the first event, I was leading, and I lost. So so much stuff happened when New Caledonia was over. Uh, I had like a month or more than a month that I couldn't sleep. I was sleeping bad, I was briefing bad, I was not briefing deeply. I was half briefing, you know, when you cannot get at the end of your lungs. And then until like mid of January, I would go running during the night to get asleep. I remember once I couldn't sleep at all, like four in the morning at European winter. I went running because I was like, fuck, I run so hard that I'm gonna take out everything and then I would go back to bed and probably sleep, never slept. Anyway, so then I understood there was something, I, I, I got to, I went to a cardiologist because I, I was waking up with this pressure and I thought I had something bad in the heart, that something was not working. So I went to the, to the cardiology and nothing was wrong, luckily. So yeah. I realized it was like, it was all in my mind, no? I was like, fuck, what is happening? I was losing weight. I couldn't train, I couldn't do shit. So then I understood that I, I needed to talk probably. I needed to, to do something that I never did. 
and uh, and and this was it, no. And uh, and and again, I thought uh, I never liked the idea to go to the uh, psychologist. Actually, on this, I already had my coach. I already had uh, Giuseppe, but I always saw him before that. I saw always saw him as a um, as a as a as a personal trainer for the gym or whatever. And then I thought, okay, I talk super nice with him. Actually, when when I talk with him, I relax. So why not throw throw some shit to him? <laughs> so that I can, I can relax, and that actually uh, worked fine. And afterwards, I always did it. So when I have some troubles or something, I call him and and we talk, and he actually listens and helps me a lot. I think it's very subjective, no? Everybody has his own uh, way to do it. Yeah. Uh, but this this helps me, or at least I think it helps me. And then because of that. It does, no? So, sure. In the end, it's just a matter of believing in what you're doing. It's not uh, really what you do. It's yeah. I was tough. Yeah. So after that, um, 2016 happens. We mentioned the switch from uh, from North Fanatic to 0.7 Starboard, and kind of a fairy tale year. I mean, the gear was probably better than you even expected. Because in 2015, I was there, the sales weren't all that great. And then 2016 was a big push to, to get them really good. And, and uh, you had that memorable photo finish in Fuerte. Um, Korea went well. Uh, Costa Brava, I don't remember, actually. But... Um, great, and- nothing special. Denmark went good, Silt went good. Yeah, you win, you dominate in Silt. And then the final event is supposed to be La Torche in France. And you get home from Silt and you see, I don't know if that was an email or a, or a text from a friend about a certain uh, magazine article in a, in a, French, in a French magazine. <laughs> with, uh, yeah, well, uh, we, we had a... With Pierre, we were all uh, we were really, I mean, really close. No, but we were close to be in the same team. We were kind of close because we were sharing uh, sessions in Maui, testing and uh, whatever, but also like eating together, wave sailing together. So then I thought we were kind of friends as well, not only uh, team uh, teammates and afterwards not teammates anymore, but whatever. And then suddenly during that year, I think in Silt. In Denmark, actually, when I was winning the event, uh, kind of he stopped. Uh, he stopped uh, talking to me, or even saying me hello or something. So I was like, well, I don't know why, but whatever. And then after a seat, I read that this. Uh, yeah, I think somebody sent to me because it was not an Italian. Uh, it was a French magazine where he was saying that uh, basically he had this interview and he said that uh, I was getting helped by the team to win and that uh, he even went so far to say that Tati helped me in Silt and Tati was not in my team. I mean, Tati was starboard but was not with the... He, he was clearly saying that point seven was helping me. Yeah, helping on the course kind of team. Yeah, racing. on the course. Helping yeah. me on the course. Yeah, yeah, like doing... Uh, yeah, not, not... Obviously, they were helping me but not... They were unfairly helping me on the course uh, helping me so much that Cookie actually had this podium in Costa Brava. I was third when I was uh, sixth or seventh. And in many in many semifinals, I was actually surprised because he was ahead of me. I was not qualifying, and he wouldn't let me pass. He was going. So uh, anyway, even even if he saw that and everything, he said that he was helping me. Other uh, Bruno was there and he was helping me, and Patty helped me in Silt. And Tati went really mental on it as well because he was like, what the fuck, now I did my competition. And uh, he was gassed as Starboard, Tati. So he had nothing to... I mean, obviously, we, yeah, we are friends. Tati is a super cool guy, but he does his race. I do my race. So, yeah, then I, I went pretty... I, I didn't like it at all, uh, the, the interview, because already I could feel in the air there was something wrong. Not said, you know, when you cross with somebody and there is something... Mm-hmm. Like a bad vibe, but it's not clear. And then he explained to the magazine like that something that he believes that it was completely untrue. And on the, on top of that, you work so much for that to get to that result and something. And this guy just throws shit about it. And uh, and he knows actually 
deep inside that is not true because he knows me, he knows uh, how I work and everything. So I got pretty pissed off. I mean, I, I don't think, I, I wouldn't agree with the last sentence because like you say, when you tell yourself something super hard, I think you can believe almost anything, you know, like I think at that point where you have all this negative energy from, you know, maybe that world title kind of slipping away from your hands and, uh, and, and you see all this 0.7 kind of team and they always stressing working as a team, et cetera, et cetera. You might jump to these conclusions, but I think anybody that's ever raced a solemn race knows how fucking hard it is to, to even qualify, to even raise that heat, let alone to think of helping your friend, your teammate, whatever, you know? No, Plus, we are all... There are a few situations where you can actually maybe do something, but on, on the whole season, that wouldn't make any difference. And it has to be a really, really clear. I mean, it's visible. No, it's not something that you say. And then it's something that didn't happen. So, uh, and anyway, to make somebody win uh, out of these situations, um, as you say, this is impossible because you have to, I mean, you, you, you either need like a team that's so bigger, it's like 50% of the fleet or otherwise it's... Yeah, plus... It's Plus, I think what people need to understand is that we are all really, I don't want to say selfish, but really individualistic people and super competitive. I mean, you don't get here, you don't get to that point uh, of racing, you know, in the World Cup by not being competitive. So then if my team boss comes and asks me to take a bullet for somebody else, like, I don't know, let, imagine you have a radio and you're yeah. not fighting for the world title, but I am, we're on the same team. And on the last straight you hear, let him pass. You would, I don't know, maybe you would laugh or uh, tell him to fuck off or whatever. I don't know, but I cannot imagine doing this, you know, because you are putting your value down, your contracts, your livelihood your result i don't care if it's uh, if it's you know if you're fighting for first or 21st you know every no, single no. that's that's what i what i fully believe in no, that is that it's so fast our competition so fast so difficult so technical so so many uh, stuff that can change in in a blink of an eye that you cannot really do anything like that. No, it's like... Yeah, I think the best example was uh, last year in 2019 in New Caledonia where, um, you know, Malte was maybe fighting for between, you know, like 15th and 20th place. And he had a couple of hits with you and he was racing as hard as ever. You were fighting for a world title. You guys are friends and he wouldn't back down, you know? So I think this is the best... Thing to no, that show. show you that nobody is actually helping you. No, uh, in that case, in that case, I actually got got uh, angry with him. Not because uh, we are friends or anything, but because uh, I mean, uh, if you are crashing me training, because uh, then then it's fine. But if you touch me twice while I'm in front of you. And we are going for a for a semi final that it actually decides my world title. At least, if you want to overtake me, overtake me clean. No, can happen once, but the third time it happens, I, I get angry. No, and that's natural that I get angry because I'm fighting for a title. I see you fighting, as you said, for top twenty or whatever, and I'm happy if you are fighting for top twenty. But don't fucking crash into me. No, that, that's what I told him. I, I was like, and I don't ask me ask you if you are in front to let me pass. I ask you if you are in the back, not to crash me. <laughs> yeah. Just go around me. Just go inside in a clean way without touching me. Go do me an inside, make me go wide, but don't touch my fucking save. That's what. Yeah, that's what I what I told him. No. And probably another yeah. example is when you guys. It was the elimination before last, and I had you in front of me, and I had a little bit of space to maybe go inside and I didn't go inside and then Rico went straight inside and then I lost, you know? So when you, when you let loose of that, I talked to no, Josh about cannot. this. 
Josh, Josh said see. that the minute uh, the minute he lost this aggression, he knew that he couldn't race anymore because you just ah, you just lose places and you feel like a pussy. You know, you'd rather. I mean, I know that a lot of people maybe hate me for this or whatever, but personally, I'd rather try than than just let everybody pass. You know. No, but it's it's a good mindset, and in the end, is uh, uh, I always think that if there is um, a, a positive outcome from what you do for yourself, then it's good to do it. No, so if if the chance is to crash and stay there, crushed on the water for, for the two of you, is higher than the chance to succeed, then you are an idiot. But if if it's probably actually the only way to over to to advance. And with that trajectory, trajectory, well, I know you say like you, you make it, then you have to do it. Then, then it's then it's even good. if the other guy falls and hates you for it, and the whole beach uh, goes mental, like uh, like what happened to you in Portugal, where you were in second behind Arnon, and uh, you went inside on the last jibe, I guess, or on the second jibe. No, it was the, the second. Was yeah, the second on the jibe. outside anyway, on the outside, and from yeah, the beach, the outside. from the beach, it looks fully like contact. And then the whole beach starts saying what an asshole you are and whatever, you know. So it's it's quite a funny little dynamic, you know. But again, no, that, that time, and Arnie never told me anything anyway because he got uh, angry. I was just staying, staying there without saying anything. I didn't go there with the, with the guys. But uh, the point is that I, never, I didn't touch him, no. I went hard inside. I overtook him. Uh, so this, this was my job. I did it, no? I, I didn't touch him. Then if I didn't touch him because he went wider, I didn't touch him because uh, of me, because of him, whatever, no? I didn't crash him. I didn't went. Uh, if he was not there, I would do that line. I would finish the jibe and go. So this is, this is my, my point of view. You see other guys that like the, the guys like this and the other guy still on the other side goes, crashes into him, no? And this makes no sense because... If the guy was not there, you would have gone straight and everybody would pass around, like inside of you. And anyway, you just put him down. There's no, there's no, there's no line. It's not like uh, in Formula One, no? Like you, you go yeah, inside. You know that this is very subjective. Out. You know that this is very, very subjective and how it looks from the outside doesn't necessarily... I know, I know, I know. I, I'm explaining my point of view and how I saw it. Then obviously... Arnon, if, if he was here, probably would tell you a different story. What is true and is objective is that there was no contact. There was no contact between me and him. Then why there was no contact, that's another issue. But there was no, uh, no contact when I flipped the sail, no contact when I went inside, no contact with the, through the boards, whatever, no. I went in, he widened up, and that's it. So this this was the what happened. Yeah, um, we touched on this now a little bit, and and uh, also in the Eight Winters uh, documentary about this funny little dynamic among us windsurfers because professional windsurfers because we are friends. We don't really travel with a group of people around you, so you're kind of forced to hang out together. And these situations happen, and they will happen. Uh, that you face a choice whether you know you go really aggressive on a friend of yours and you you benefit from that but the guy is going to be pissed and uh, you basically yeah there is a big chance that your friendship is going to you know there's going to be a difference in your relationship or whatever and uh, talk 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 to us a little bit about that because it seems that I mean, I don't think you're very bothered about this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, well, the, the point, again, I think if something happens, it happens because there is, um, I mean, if, if I, ca I can overtake you for a line, it means that I, ca I cannot, it means I'm faster in that moment in a competition and elimination. No? So then uh, if I do it clean without touching you, that's again my point of view. And, uh, and and I'm aggressive. 
then it's fair no, that you do it. Yeah, but you keep saying no touching, no touching, and then we both know that many times there is contact when you are on the inside or, I don't know, uh, Pierre goes... With Antoine, we touched. With Antoine, we touch. Every time we, we go to Fuerte, we have, like, the first jive, we have contact, and nothing, nothing happens. Uh, we cross, we touch each other uh, with luck. Uh, no one of us until now, because of that, uh, fell. And then, uh, and then we fight, and, and then it's good. I mean, I, I like doing that, and I like... Uh, and then if, if anyway, somebody overtakes me, uh, I don't crash, he touches me, and, and he had a better line, whatever, I actually have to, have to admit it, he competed. I mean, he raced better, no? There's no... Uh, I have no... Um, uh, no problem to admit that, no? Like, I lost a world, another world title, I lost it when... Uh, 2018, I, I, I could have won. I know that I lost for sure, but I could have won. But the point is that the last jive I was qualifying for the winner's final and I got stuck with a wave. I, I actually didn't wait for the wave. So I got stuck and Basil just came, went around me uh, super close and he, he, he had a better jive and he had a better jive. He, he, he passed the hit. I didn't. I mean, it's the same. Eh? In the end, it's the same. I, I think- my I think a lot of these complaints come from, um, you know, a place of like emotion rather than pure calculation, you know, and um, yeah. what really s- not surprised me maybe, but w- when I understood what's going on is when I start racing with you guys, let's say the big three um, last year in Fuerte and like the, the first two or three finals, I got to the mark top two, top three, and you guys were so much fucking more aggressive that I, there was no chance. I was just, you know, jibing, you know, jibing how I would jibe before. And I realized like, okay, these guys are racing super hard, you know, and, and there is this kind of respect that, like you say, you know, if somebody pulls off a move that maybe is a little bit dirty, like, I don't know, like Pierre did to you in Fuerte that basically to... Yeah, but again, it again was my mistake because I was focusing to the front and I didn't see him shooting down and taking the inside, no? And then, and then actually, uh, that was the move that, that I, I was only watching Antoine to be first without thinking that actually Pierre doing that move would advance me and get in second and I would go to third. So then was my my mistake no obviously he took his chance he couldn't win anymore and the and the best move he could do was going inside and get in front of me and with that secure himself a second place instead of third and he did that so again i would never talk bad about that move even even though he touched me he pushed me out because i would have done the same and then uh, and then we didn't crash uh, it was it was super fun even though i lost and uh, and was a matter of like uh, lines, no? Again, I went straight uh, straight in full speed, uh, leaving a little bit of space, and it took advantage. Of it. And then, uh, as you said, no, like you you when you're there fighting, it's like like this super fast the reaction and everything. And he has not been an asshole in that occasion. I would never say that. He just went uh, as uh, as I as I would do. So yeah yeah that's that's my thing like uh, between let's say you Antoine Pierre it happens all the time and then when it happens outside of that uh, you know everybody likes to watch it like uh, the guys let's say that are outside of the final they love to watch it but when it happens to them on a on a quarter final or whatever they they start throwing rocks at each other and uh, fighting on the <laughs> beach and uh, screaming and whatever so so yeah, but anyway, um, moving on. So from 2016, basically till now, you, you've come uh, vice world champion basically every year, if I'm not mistaken. And um, probably every single year was different. But at the same time, I don't want you to go year by year, but yeah. what do you think you missed? And what do you think are the percentages of let's say the percentages of success, what comes into it. So let's say we have gear, 
we have your physicality, we have your mental side, so we have your psychology. Some people mention luck as well. I don't yeah. know if that's really a factor over the course of a season, but how, how do you no, slice that? I path? think it's a, it's a mix. Is a mix of all of it. Also, black is a mix of it. Every year, as a peak, if you see as a, it's a, as a as a circle, and you have all these factors around, that every year there is like a part that is pulling. No, so there is one year that actually you are lacking a bit of speed because of the gear, and that could be in 2017. Maybe I didn't have the best performing year in light winds or stuff, so it was struggling a bit, and then. Uh, actually was the year that I clearly, uh, I mean, was, was good at Antoine 1. There was no, what, when somebody w wins, is always good because it means that he deserves it. This said, on that year, it was like clear he had to win. So there was no. On 2018, uh, I had these few mistakes. One of these was this jive, for example, I mentioned or something like that. And that uh, I was, I think I was really close, and I, I, I could have won uh, on 18. So, saying what was the problem on that year, I don't know. Probably something mental. Um, I mean, if you call it a problem, because it's yeah, but so you just said that, that with worse won. gear, with worse gear, you almost won. So sometimes, many times, it's like this. Yeah, but I was, far, I was in. I was close to win, but far from winning uh, on 217. Uh, I would need uh, an extra gear to win that year. While in 2018, I could, but I didn't. And in 2019, uh, in my perception, I should have won. Um, but uh, I had, uh, for sure, uh, a mistake uh, in one final. And then uh, I had bad luck uh, for sure as well. And then uh, whatever, uh, Pierre deserved it anyway. Uh, I, I don't want to say that Pierre didn't. Pierre uh, is always there and deserved to win. And he won because he always, he's, it always win uh, who deserves it. So it's not like uh, coming by luck. But I, I didn't have such a great luck, uh, especially in... Uh, uh, in New Caledonia in the last couple of days, I didn't have like such a great luck, uh, but as well, I was stressed, so it's a mix, it's always a mix. Uh, it sucks when, when the luck comes in, uh, that sucks. I think it sucks more than other stuff. I kind of digest a lot more if I'm not fast, I'm not ready, it's my mistake, but when there is a, something like when I got, when I got the, the snake in the semi-final, something like that really, uh, pushes you down because you get angry and anger is probably the worst feeling you can have while you're fighting for something so important for yourself because then the whole balance gets fucked because you start thinking bad you start uh, the negativity comes in strong and everything so one unlucky event brings with itself uh, a lot of negativity for you and this you up on other sides now so on on your mental side on uh, you do mistakes then you just lose the balance so this is yeah. uh, difficult no yeah I how think for how, me is more difficult how much of that do you carry into your like personal life i don't know you come back you had a bad day on the course and you talk to your girlfriend and instead of you know being usual you are start shouting or whatever how much does that carry over i don't know i don't i don't really i get like i get a bit negative and uh, sad but i don't really carry much over <laughs> maybe maybe it's actually a mistake i should scream i should uh, throw <laughs> stuff or something but this uh, doesn't happen so often i'm more of a calm guy and uh, and and with the with the year by year i can digest this kind of stuff better and I live better after it happens. Uh, while before, I wouldn't be able to just like uh, switch off and think about something different. So now I'm kind of uh, kind of able to do it. No, I I get in this negative mood for 
not too long. Uh, so this, I'm pretty happy about it because in the end years, your life is the most important thing. So uh, if you carry this negativity to other, all the other sides, then it actually affects everything while it shouldn't, no? It should just affect that moment uh, in that place. Yeah. Easier to say than to do, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, which which brings us which brings us to the next question, because we always you know guys bunch of guys traveling together. Of course, the the one uh, common topic that goes around is girls and girlfriends and wives and stuff like this. So uh, we always talked about uh, dating a windsurfer or not. So now that you <laughs> now that you're actually doing it, <laughs> now that you're actually dating a windsurfer, share share how it how it is. It's it's actually good. We are sharing a lot a lot of stuff. It's it's nice. We're staying together. Uh, I think it's cool because in the end, uh, I mean, we 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 do our lives. Uh, it's not that uh, we share everything. So. Every everyone has his own. Uh, I think everyone has uh, has to have his own uh, uh, equipment, objective, <laughs> objective <laughs> equipment. Yeah, sure. Uh, but on that side, I I I, I borrowed there quite a lot of gear this winter. But I was happy. I was happy to to see her sitting on that. But the point is that I think every everyone has his own um, way. Let's say is on a track and uh, for example she's more into the the olympic thing uh, she sees this future on on it i think in in something like that you you want that no you don't want to share also uh, also that i mean you want you, your own world to be your own world and everything this helps but uh, i don't know until now it's it's, it's fine it's nice uh, and we, we go with sailing together, surfing together. So it's, it's cool, no? You don't have to fight to do something that you, you both love. So it's, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. So this whole COVID situation is not going to last forever, hopefully. Um, and the tour is going to restart. And, you know, I've been and you've been probably in touch uh, with the PWA that probably there is going to be some small or bigger changes to how the tour operates and uh, how the media is etc so what do you expect moving forward from from professional windsurfing and and what do you think is the direction that it should actually take i think that we uh, on the racing side we are doing a great job as a sport so our sport is really nice and uh, it would be nice to watch and uh, our discipline is the easiest to watch and to understand and uh, it's really entertaining i guess uh, that said we are missing uh, media coverage we are missing uh, a lot of this stuff we talked about uh, about it with you as well with jimmy and i guess we should uh, force the pwa uh, to get like uh, into this this media uh, more advertisement uh, more view from the outside because i guess for example my final with antoine last year when i crashed uh, mediatic wise would be in, would have been really good and uh, we had many on every basically every competition we have moments like that maybe that one was pre pretty cool like in particular but we our Edition are really nice to watch, and with Ben, Ben Profit, like uh, as a as a speaker, it's really entertaining because he's uh, he knows every of us. He can present us also in a different way. So I think we should change the way we present our sport in a more profound way and uh, and get uh, world uh, worldwide on the on the media in a different way. Just not with the live stream that is uh, only for the windsurfing fans. And it's gonna stay like that if we don't yeah. uh, we don't move. No, if we want the windsurf to change, obviously. If you want yes. it to be just a a bunch of free sailors, then we can stay as we are. What do you think of the idea to get some of that media coverage with uh, basically reducing the prize money and putting that 
into media? Yeah, well, I, I, I discussed, I mean, uh, we were talking about this with, uh, also with Jimmy, uh, uh, about different case scenarios, and um, I, I wouldn't mind. I mean, if I, if I see a project and this actually uh, gets voted by us and we think that it's gonna work, uh, then it's the only way to move and actually if we don't just look at tomorrow but maybe at the day after tomorrow this investment we make now can bring us a lot more money uh, and uh, in the future so I think it's, it's just investing a little bit now to have a lot more in the future a lot more fun yeah. better events better sponsors uh, better lifestyle and more money yeah so, and and i think this is what every every one of us wants so why not why not okay we're gonna wrap it up with a couple of quick hitters um what what would be your perfect tour couple couple tour stops to be on a couple um, uh, portugal uh portugal back would be cool and uh fuerte kanaha pozo uh omezaki in japan maybe no, no, cape, no light winds. cape town no no light winds <laughs> for sure no light winds <laughs> in my dream tour there wouldn't be any light winds there would be yeah. like uh, nice places and and windy beach starts yes or no Yes. Obstacles on the course. Yes or no? Yes. What are your pet peeves? What am I? <laughs> pet peeves, the thing that you kind of um, hate in a way that is almost a physiological phobia. Like, a, um, ah, okay. okay. I don't know. For me, it's a for dentist. That, I, for I had no idea what was that. Yeah. Light wind. Super light. Pumping. <laughs> Pumping. Pumping. That's a good one. <laughs> how many times a day do you pee your wetsuit? Depends how long I stay in the wetsuit. Ten? <laughs> what is your guilty pleasure? Ah, fuck, I have too many. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Your top five windsurfers. Of uh, all time. Of all time. All time. Uh, Bjorn, Jason, Josh Stone, Robin Ash, uh, Antoine. Not about five. We actually had already a couple of people and nobody has the same top five. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, most underrated windsurfer of all time. Underrated. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, that's difficult. Levi, maybe? I don't know. That's not bad. <laughs> what is... Okay, let's start with an easier one. One spot you'd have to sail every single day for the rest of your life, but you have to go and you have to sail. What would it be? But I would like to do it. You have to go every single day. For the one rest spot. of your life. One spot. Yeah. I don't know. The, the toilet. <laughs> no, I mean, man, a spot, a winter spot. <laughs> but I choose it or, or what? Like, uh, is yeah, you can choose the spot, I... but you have to go windsurfing every uh, single day. People. Okay. What's the furthest you ever traveled only and specifically to see a girl? Only and specifically? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, not, not, too, not too far. Eh? <laughs> 10 minutes, I don't know. Not too far, <laughs> not too far. Most coffees you had in a day? Six. Who's the best cook on tour? You? <laughs> Definitely not. 
<laughs> You're Polish. <laughs> okay, who is your worst competitor? My worst competitor. Uh, on the heat, and you're like, go like, fuck, not again. Well, with the last event uh, in my mind, Malte. <laughs> and last but not least, who would you want to hear on this podcast that you would actually listen to the whole thing? Huh? Uh, well, Robin Ash would be cool. That would be really cool. I will have to ask him about Bernd Rodriguez, though. <laughs> Would be lovely. Yeah. Do it, do it as the first question. Yeah. And this way, we finished exactly where we started. So it yeah. doesn't get better than this. Thanks, Mattel. Thanks a lot <laughs> for your time. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. I well, hope you have a good one there in, uh, in Tarifa. And uh, hope to see you soon, because this means we can travel again. Exactly. I hope you too. Cheers, mate. Ciao, ciao. You're around. Bye. And there we go. That's it for another podcast. Did you make it all the way through? Uh, let us know in the comments what you thought of that. I think there's some interesting, juicy bits in there for sure. Um, and well done, Matt Check, again. Um, if you want to support the podcast, uh, they're proving to be... Uh, a fair bit of work, I've got to be honest. So if you want to support with a few beers, uh, I think we'd all be very appreciative. Uh, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss another podcast. Uh, and coming up next week, we have got no other than El Presidente, Jimmy Diaz. And you're thinking, Jimmy Diaz? I tell you what. You will change your tune because uh, Matt Jack had a super interesting chat with him. Um, and there's some behind the scenes. The guy has been doing the Piloway tour, I think, for longer than anybody else. And he has got some stories. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one. So tune in next week. <laughs>